Hi, it's Deborah Hamilton. Thank you so much for coming to another chapter of Why Do Pets Matter? We're talking with Josh Weisman today. He is the CEO of Flourish, and we're going to talk about so many things that relate to positive thinking, putting people in a place to really thrive, knowing your magnificence and what you aren't good at, and of course, always appreciating when you can make a mistake and learn from it. So let's hear what Josh has to say. <laughs> Hi, I'm Deborah Hamilton. Welcome to my podcast, Why Do Pets Matter? Ten years ago, with my iPhone and a script, I recorded the first episode of the Ultimate Pet Resolution Summit, which chatted with experts about conflicts over animals. Our conversations were intimate, honest, and illustrated how disagreements over animals occur and how those disagreements can reshape people's lives and relationships. In November 2019, I started Why Do Pets Matter, a new podcast that continued these informative discussions. I'm so excited to have you here with me, continuing my exploration into a more meaningful conversation about why pets matter to all of us. My guests and I will share ideas, stories, and experiences straight from the heart, unscripted and holistic. From the bravest moments to the most brokenhearted, we will explore how to resolve disagreements over animals differently. One thing I know for sure is I want to have more meaningful conversations that will help all of us unlock that deeply felt human-animal bond that drives the emotions of conflict. Hi, everyone. Deborah Hamilton. And today we have my good friend, Josh Weissman. He is the CEO of Flourish the wonderful company for veterinary medicine and also wrote the fabulous book thrive. Welcome, Josh. Hey, welcome Deb. Thanks for having me here. So tell us a little bit about what it is that you do. And then I'll ask our question. Sure. Yeah. So, um, so I started a consulting firm about seven years ago called Flourish Veterinary Consulting uh, after 20 something years in veterinary practice. The whole idea of Flourish is we, we think of ourselves as translators uh, so there's there's a robust area of research and a variety of social sciences on um, what are the antecedents and contrib contributing variables for human well-being. And we're really interested in what are those variables that contribute to well-being in the workplace specifically. So we try and take what the science says works and then we translate it and make it usable. The idea being that if it is usable, and accessible, then people will use it and access it. And then together we'll create workplaces in vet med where the people of vet med can thrive actually in and through their work. I wrote a book about this, as you mentioned, it's called Lead to Thrive, the science of crafting a positive veterinary culture. Uh, it's available on Amazon. And uh, that's, that's how I spend my days now. I love it because, you know, you and I are both on the same mission to make veterinarians lives better and their clients lives better by making veterinarians lives. It's a, it's an infinity sign for me. You yes. know, if we make the veterinarians lives better, the clients lives will be better. If we make the clients lives better. The veterinarians lives will be better. So this is the infinity sign. Yep. So before I run my mouth too much, you have to <laughs> answer the question, Josh, why do pets matter to you? Yeah, that's a really, I love that question. Um, pets matter to me for a couple of reasons. On a personal level, pets matter to me because they are like a just a constant true source of joy and companionship. And um, companionship in particular is really an essential human need. Uh, the need to feel like we matter in the world is uh, a need that comes from others. And pets are just such a really wonderful way to show us how we matter each and every day. And I feel that. I feel that every day. You know, I, the work that I do, Deb, much like with you, there's a lot of travel involved. And sometimes I'm gone for two or three or four days at a time. And there is almost nothing that replicates the feeling of walking into your home and your pets being like the dogs showing up, even the cat, and be like, oh, my gosh, he's home. I have um, I have a small parrot. You you can't see her on the camera here, but she's just to the right of me. Uh, her name is Dahlia. She's a little Piona. She's about the size of a, a parakeet, but thicker. Um, and when I come home from a trip, Dahlia makes the cutest little squeaks when she hears my voice. Like that feeling that you can't help but feel that you matter in the world. The second thing as to why pets matter to me is I think pets are a really great way for human beings to express their full humanity. The relationship that we have with animals 
really brings out all of who we are as human beings, the complex, beautiful, messy things that come together to make us people. And sometimes that's truly wonderful. Uh, you know, the ways that we come together to help animals. Um, we have right now in Colorado, it's the end of July. There are no less than three fires burning in the last two days that just started uh, along the Colorado Front Range between Denver and uh, basically Fort Collins. And my feed on my social media is lit up with people saying, hey, if you and your pets need a place to stay, just DM me. The, the shelters are showing, but hey, we will take pets in and take care of them for as long as needed so that you don't have to worry about it. Like animals bring out sometimes the very best in us. They also sometimes bring out the dark and ugly parts of who we are, which is a very real part of who we are. And so animals, I think for me, are a great conduit for humanity to be expressed and for us to get to see our wholeness. You know, that's the template. I love this. There's so many things I want to explore with you because you said a few things that were really incredible. I'm going to start with the um, last one first, which is everyone coming together to help people on the front range who may be in danger. Um, Wednesday night, uh, I, Wednesday nights, I have a call where people come together to build that plan, to build that community, mm -hmm. because it is so important mm -hmm. when disasters occur that there are places for pets to go. We learned that during Katrina. Um, and now it seems that pets matter and people recognize that. And so I love that you shared that on your um, social media feed, people are saying, DM me, DM me, let me know. Yeah, yeah it's been really cool to see. It's because it is so important and people don't always think about creating um, a plan for their pets in the event of an emergency until the emergency is there. And thankfully, there are things that are out there in the minute. But um, in, in the MAP community, we think about things long term. So we want we want to have something in place so we know we can go there, go here. So when this is all going on, for those of you who are listening who might be in the front range and need help, DM those people and say, listen, I'm safe now, but can I take your number? So that yeah. if something happens, you know, a, a year from now, maybe you'd mm -hmm. be able to help me. Because it really is very frightening um to make a plan for a pet because you don't know who it is. Yep. So you said some things that were really impactful to me. Um when you were talking, they you said that pets really reflect your whole humanity. Mm -hmm. I'd love to unpack that a little because it does impact us how we um, respond to pets and how we care for our pets. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. How we respond to pets and care for pets. Can you say a bit more about that? Sure. So when you respond to pets, uh, are you outgoing with all pets or just outgoing with your own pets? When you care for pets, um, do you, you know, volunteer anywhere or is it is it just, you know, um, being the conduit for education for the care of pets? Yeah, an animals are are very central to my life in many, many ways. When When I am traveling for work, probably about half of the messages that I'm sending my wife are, um, oh, there's a service dog on the plane. Here's a picture. I snuck up him. Uh, like, you know, it's like things like that, right? Uh, I was just in uh, Mackinac Island in Northern Michigan. And, you know, I'm, I'm sending pictures and videos of all the horses around the island and things like that. Yeah, any, any time, any opportunity that I have out in the world to get close to another animal, that I, I will seize that opportunity. Uh, very, very important thing for me. In terms of like caring for animals and how I show up in the world for that. Let me focus that a little bit more. Sure. That's sort of what you're doing when you're making, um, you're creating your plans and um, assistance and teachings for veterinarians. Because you're Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I feel like there's, there's um, primary, secondary, maybe even tertiary ways that, that we're trying to impact the lives of animals and the work that we do. Uh, you know, the, the primary thing is obviously the animals that we care for. Um, and then the things that myself and, and uh, members of the Flourish team do out in the world. Uh, you know, I've done volunteer work. There's um, a, a pretty well-known uh, wildlife rehab rehabilitation center in Colorado called Greenwood. I was on the board for them for a few years, did some volunteer work there. Uh, there's a really neat organization I would encourage everybody to look into called Project Animal Aid uh, that I was on the board for for a while. Actually, a veterinarian that I worked with many years ago started that organization. Um, Project Animal Aid essentially takes in used or expired medical supplies and equipment 
So it could be syringes or gloves or masks or an anesthesia machine, a surgery table, things like that. And then um, we, I'm, I'm going to say we, because I still feel like I'm a part of the organization. Uh, we then, we partner with nonprofit veterinary service providing organizations around the globe. Um, you can't see it, but to the left of me here, there's a, uh, it's um, a sheet of paper that is made out of grass and it's in a frame and on it, you know, about the size of like a, a very large watermelon is the footprint of an elephant named Coco. Uh, that was from the Victoria Falls Wildlife Trust in Zimbabwe. Uh, we provide equipment for them. So they take in, you know, animals like elephants that are harmed or sick or whatever, and they take care of them, rehabilitate them. If they can, they release them. And if they can't, they care for them for the rest of their lives. Being a part of an organization like that was really, really, really cool. Uh, and then, of course, secondarily, we're we're there to try and help the teams that are delivering the care of veterinary medicine so that the animals in their care receive better care. And there's there's actually some really cool science behind that. Y you may be aware of some of this. There's um, really interesting research in, in human medicine that shows that when we cultivate healthier workplaces, when we create more positive work environments, specifically in the in the uh, three or four pieces of research that I'm thinking of right now, when we have people in charge who are caring, kind, compassionate, um, you know, development oriented, strength based human beings, so good quality leaders in a, in a healthcare setting, the result of that is not just that the people working there do and feel better at work. They do. We see that. We see job satisfaction improves, turnover uh, goes down, engagement, um, a thing in the literature that we refer to as organizational citizenship behaviors, which is, um, you know, Deb, you might work on a team of five people and uh, one of those people comes up to you and says, hey, uh, I've got a bit of free time this afternoon. Is there anything that you need help with? That's organizational citizenship right there. All of those things get better. But what's really cool is we've seen in multiple studies that when leadership improves and the work environment improves, the delivery of care improves as rated by the patients. So the patients themselves, unaware of what's happening behind the scenes in the organization and with leaders, report, I receive better quality care. The nurse team, the doctor team, they seem more caring and kind and compassionate. They seem more patient. I feel better taken care of. Compliance improves simply because of the input of positive leadership. Um, so I think that we're helping patients that way too. Or I love, I love that because that helps the client and the animals. And you know, that's the infinity that we're working together to bring because it's, it usually, and I know that you've also got the wonderful, um, positive, uh, credentials next to your name, um, because you've done that. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but that positivity, that looking at the glass as half full, which is a little simplistic because it's really hard to look at the glass as half full when you're miserable. Um, yes. You know, the the ability to have people uh, take a step back, sort of when I, when I started this morning, if someone was, you know, using some of my work, instead of saying, oh my God, they pirated my work, saying, well, I'm glad it's getting out there. Mm -hmm. I'm glad it's being used by someone to assist and we all teach it differently. So whoever's going to get this information is going to get it differently. Mm -hmm. uh, but I love that you talked about the leaders who started to lead instead of manage or micromanage. And I think that's something that really has been a little bit of um, a bugaboo in veterinary medicine. Uh, that they the veterinarians come out of school with very little training in really leadership. And I mean that mm -hmm. with all affection to all the veterinarians who are listening to this. I mean that with all love and affection. It's hard to learn how to be a really good leader mm -hmm. unless you have a really good mentor when you come out of school or you had a really good mentor in school or, you know, you take classes with someone like Josh or have Josh come in to help you. So tell me a little bit about how you're finding your work in veterinary medicine is it being um is it being welcomed is it is it sort of a little fearful for uh some practices um or is it just 
not resonating with some veterinarians? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really great question. I appreciate you asking that. Um, so I've been doing this now for seven years. Uh, and I, at this point in time, in turn, just webinars and in-person like lectures or, or workshops, uh, formal structured events like those, I've probably delivered somewhere in the vicinity of six to 700 of them, um, maybe a little bit more. Um, some of them as small as, you know, groups of 10 or 15, some of them as large as groups of 800 to a thousand. So in total between there, I've, I've in some way, shape or form encountered tens of thousands of people in veterinary medicine, many of whom are in some form of leadership, whether it be, uh, a reception lead all the way up to a CEO of, uh, you know, one of the, the corporate, uh, groups. And what I can tell you, and I, I really do believe this. I can probably count on my two hands and I won't need both hands. How many of them actually have like nefarious intentions when it comes to the impact that they have on the people in their workplace? Pretty much everybody that I've met in vet med genuinely wants to do the best they can for the people around them so that together they can all deliver the kind of care that that they want to deliver because that's why they're here. That's why they do what they do. But like you said, nobody teaches us what it means to to impact and influence and lead other human beings. To be a high performer and to be the kind of person who cultivates high performers are two very, very different things. You don't actually need to be the best at what you do to create people who are the best at what they do. But somehow we've gotten into this habit of, you know, it's a bit of the Peter principle. People do really, really well in their role. You're such a great associate you should probably be the medical director. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, those are two different skill sets, right? But people do crave it. They do want it. And so ultimately to answer the question, I have found more often than not that people are very receptive to the message that we deliver. It's not the receptivity that's the challenge. It's the the delivery of the concepts that is the challenge because it's it feels so different and it feels like giving up control. Yeah. And that's a really hard thing to do, especially when, you know, the life of another living thing and your license, your ability to make a living feels so inexorably tied to what you feel like you need to control. I, I love that because it's, it's understanding the inner torment of someone who has excelled in what they're doing mm -hmm. and yet their magnificent magnificence isn't in um, maybe teaching other people what they're doing. Some people are great mentors. Some people not so good. Some yes. people are great <laughs> mentees. I mean, I know I learned yeah. so much from my community in the MAP program because they come up with things that I've never thought of. And yeah. I know with your work, that's how we're wired. If somebody comes up and tells me, you know, I don't think you covered this. I go, thank you so much. Not not reactive because you and I are learning just as much as they're learning. And I think that's the important piece you just laid out for us is that it takes time to hear this information, absorb it yeah. and then implement it in yep. a way that's authentic for you because you and I, it's completely authentic. We could do this all day, every day with our eyes closed. And yet it's completely foreign to the people who are coming to our webinar seminars or presentations. Mm -hmm whatever. And um, for you, I know you have this phenomenal um, additional uh, training that keeps you so positive. So tell us a little bit about that, because that really does impact uh, probably how you, um, why pets matter to you and the positivity they bring, which was the first part of what we discussed when they come home. But tell us a little bit more about that, because I love it. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So uh, when I left, um practice when I when I uh, sold um, the equity that uh, that I had for the last practice I was a part of I went back to school and I did a master's degree in applied positive psychology and coaching psychology um, and mm, since then I've done a variety of um, additional certifications and training in, in areas like appreciative inquiry and positive organizational scholarship uh, positive leadership things of that nature these are all evidence-based approaches to cultivating these kinds of healthy workplace environments, essentially. Um, I'm going back to school again. Actually, um, my colleague, uh, Andy Davison at Flourish and I just um, uh, in a couple of three weeks, I think, are starting a new program out of the University of uh, Arkansas at Little Rock. 
in their applied communications department. We're doing a um, graduate certificate in conflict management. And what I really love about this particular um, certificate program is that it's heavily steeped in positive communication practices. Um, so the, I think he's the interim Dean right now. Um, <clears throat> he's on faculty at the university of, uh, Arkansas, Little Rock. His name is Julian Mirivel, M I R I V E L. Um, Julian and, um, a colleague of his Alex Leon, L Y O N co-authored a book that was published just in the past year, uh, positive communication for leaders. And it leverages an evidence-based framework for cultivating high, essentially high quality relationships from a leadership perspective that bring all these kinds of outcomes that we're after. Uh, so this, all of this is to say, it, this is all education around what, what we've been talking about. You know, like I said, I, we think of ourselves as translators. This is, I'm going to say this, it's a bit tongue in cheek and I hope people don't take offense to this because I don't mean it offensively, but this is not Deepak Chopra stuff. This is not like, you know, philosophical, dogmatic approach to, you know, positivity. This is science-based. This is what actually seems to influence human psyche from a psychological perspective, what changes our neuropsychological response to the world. How do we create healthier mindsets through healthier workplaces? I love that because in the creation of conflict resolution, if you can show the evidence-based physiological change if you just take a breath before you <clears throat> yeah if you just take a breath before you answer i've i've given so many of these talks and i always tell the veterinarians you don't have to answer your client right away and yeah we do and i go no you don't well what are we supposed to say and i i usually share with them thank you so much for sharing that with me josh that was really important information that i needed to hear and can I have, you know, an hour or two, a day or two, whatever you need to really digest what you said. And can we get back together? Yep. And I think probably in your training, you tell them to take a breath. Don't decide on the fly when you're defensive and reactive. Um, but also you and I both know getting back to someone after a difficult conversation is really hard. It can be extremely hard. Absolutely. It's, but it's essential. You know, one of, one of the most common complaints that we hear among veterinary team members is um, there doesn't seem to be follow-up in this hospital. <laughs> like I'll hear that all the time, right? Like, you know, we, we, we have these meetings or, you know, I submit some sort of a concern or complaint and then nothing really comes of it. And, and I think a lot of that is because of a, a, a fear of um, it's conflict avoidance, right? You know, people in leadership are good people and they have good intentions and just like the rest of us, they want to be liked and they want to be uh, included and they want to feel like they belong and they want a happy team. And so oftentimes that leads them to not do the difficult things that need to be done. Yeah. And then it, it, from the team's perspective, it looks like absentee leadership. And that's, that's such a delicate dance. I love the way you said, you know, you have to translate it in a way. So mm -hmm. that it's like learning a new language. So when you first started, when you got out of the um, ownership role and you went back to school, I know that I was a litigator and went for mediation training and then understanding based mediation training, which is probably sort of positively oriented in conflict coach training and all the rest. It was, it was like learning a different language for me. How did you feel? Was it, was it really hard at first? Cause it was hard for me at first. And I, I call myself a serial mediation trainer, a uh, training taker, uh, because I really needed to practice the skills of active listening. Uh, yes, it was all very challenging skills to learn. And they're not skills that you master quickly either. I mean, seven years of soaking in this 24 hours a day as my entire career focus. I I don't know, maybe I'm 40% of the way there. <laughs> like, I'm glad you said that. I'm glad yeah. you said that. Because, you know, there were times when I was training and I used to fly off the handle with my kids or my husband. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden, maybe you had this same feeling. You would say, oh, wait a minute, let me breathe. All yeah. the yeah. things that you're learning, you actually implement in your own life. Yes, yes. Slowly over time, they start to become a thing. But one of the lessons that I try and... um convey to to folks now when you know when we're working with people in leadership positions or working with practices or working with teams that are trying to adopt some of these approaches Th these are not 
the default ways of being. Uh, there's a lot of neuropsychological and physiological drive to not be this way. Yeah. And so it takes a lot of intentional effort to, to over build, time. yeah, over time to build the habits. You will not be perfect at this ever. You will have stumbles along the way. There will be moments of awkwardness and strangeness. You, you will spend a lot of time sort of, um, debriefing and asking for forgiveness and learning from those stumbles. Uh, and that's actually really critical. It turns out that that's, that's where the power, the powerful environment is built. It's not actually in the doing it perfectly. It's in the desire to, or the willingness, the openness to try and, and be imperfect and then own the imperfection along with the others around you uh, actually creates the much healthier space. You, you don't have to get this right all the time. You just have to get it right more than you are now. That's it. Yeah. Uh, it, I love that because, you know, being imperfect also enables people and owning it, right? Uh, being imperfect, owning it, and not, you know, in a way that degrades yourself. Because we know some people who will like throw themselves on their sword and degrade themselves. I'm just so stupid. No, that's not what um, yeah. Josh is talking about. He's talking about, wow. I had someone tell me once, I used to use the word courage when somebody tells you something that's difficult to hear. Thank you. It, probably took courage for you. And someone came up to me and said, you know, courage is a really triggering word for me. And I said, tell me more because I wanted to know what created that. And now yeah. I'm thoughtful when I'm using that word because it could be triggering to people who may have a different life experience than I do. Because as you know, and I know, the most important piece of leadership is understanding um, the life experience you're bringing to the table and then understanding the life experience of the people who are working around you so mm -hmm. that you can all sort of row the boat in the same direction, even though your oars are a little different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well said. I totally agree. It's, it's so important. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to wrap up with just one more thought. So when you come home and the dogs are thrilled to see you, <laughs> that is really sort of, I think from everything we've talked about here today, one of the reasons that you do what you do, because you want people to have thriving dogs around them, both as people in the practice and also people with pets. That's absolutely true. I think that those moments of joy, everybody deserves to have those as frequently as possible. And we just want to make sure that we maximize that frequency. And it's important to understand the um, point that you made, which is so impactful to me, you're, you're not going to get this perfect, but embrace the imperfection. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The goal, the goal, um, oh, I'm trying to think, I think it might've been Amy Edmondson who said something along these lines. Um, and it really stuck with me. We need to replace the pursuit of perfection with the pursuit of excellence. The pursuit of excellence allows us the space to, to improve, uh, to recognize areas where we're falling a bit short and to do a bit better next time. Um, it's not a zero sum game. Excellence is something you can always be pursuing. The pursu pursuit of perfection is either you're there or you're not. And if you're not, you failed and perfection is impossible. So you're always a failure. That's not helpful. Uh, yeah, I, again, I think that if we can just be a bit better at this every day, that's all we need. And I love it because my, um, guru on a lot of these things is uh, Brene Brown. She has some great quotes. One of them that I use in my mediation practices all the time is we're here to try to get it right for the dog. Cause sometimes I do divorce or I do, you know, veterinary issues. We're going to get it right for the dog mm -hmm. um, instead of being right for ourselves. Yes, exactly. It's it or, or the cat or the bird or the horse, you know, yep. whatever animal is, is rocking your boat. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it's it really is important not to have the striving for perfection get in the way of the good you're trying to do. Absolutely agree. Well said. So, Josh, let us know how people might be able to follow you. Now, you said you had your book that I didn't give the entire title. My apologies. I just love it says thrive, because to me, if we don't get up every every morning and want to thrive, um, our hearts will not be full. So tell them where they can get that and where they might be able to get back in touch with you to hear more about what you're doing and whether or not you can help them in their practice. 
Sure. Yeah. So Lead to Thrive is available on Amazon. Um, it's also available through Kindle and pretty much every audiobook platform available. Uh, if you can stand the sound of my voice, then you can do the audiobook. You can find Flourish at uh, www.flourish.vet. Uh, and then I'm pretty active on uh, LinkedIn. So if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, please do. That would be great. Josh, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. And I I hope we can gather again in a few months because I know that once you start the um, teaching at the University of Arkansas, it's going to be a whole nother discussion on what you're finding. So I'd love for you to come back. I would like that very much. Thanks, Deb. Appreciate you. Awesome. Appreciate you. Well, this is Deborah Hamilton, Hamilton Law Mediation, and of course, the Why Do Pets Matter podcast.